welcome to the ZRD3 Debates Designing Futures, which is a series of uh, interviews or interviews organized by ZRD3 House for Contemporary Art in collaboration with them. My name is Karen Verschoren and I work as a curator for ZRD3. Uh, most of you probably know us through our thematic exhibitions in, we, in which we try to connect to complex problems uh, and try to relate to them through art, design, sometimes architecture. We really aim to dig deep, uh, looking for alternative and just more meanings. And that's exactly what we're going to try and do in the next couple of days in these interviews. So on the program today is the topic of design and future thinking. Tomorrow, Jan and Josef are going to debate about the practice of exhibiting and more concretely the idea of a manifesta for design or a European design parliament. On Thursday, we'll talk about mentorship and collaboration in design. And Friday, finally, we'll debate about the question what Milan can mean for the evolution of design discourse and critique. Maybe back to the topic of today, uh, design and future thinking. More and more futurists are looking at design and the tools of design to help them communicate their visions and to connect to more people out there. The question then is how do designers relate to this field of future thinking? Is the future a topic for designers or for design and maybe for which part of the design spectrum? And if it is, what does that mean for the responsibilities of those designers dealing with those issues in their practice. Um, we've got a fantastic speaker over here, Tobias Revel, who's going to be interviewed by uh, Jan Bullen. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Grichich couldn't make it today. Um, so that's, uh, but that's no problem. <laughs> um, in any case, all of the questions that I just mentioned you're probably familiar with, uh, we emailed them beforehand, so please do feel free to jump in and um, speak your mind as we move along. You, there's no need to wait for it till the end. Um, a couple of practical things still, if you'd like to tweet, that would be great. We're using the hashtag Z33Debates or Z33Milan. If you'd like to reserve a seat for the debates tomorrow or the next days, that's great as well. Just come and talk to me, I'll add you to the list. And finally, we're in this beautiful, beautiful uh, Galleria del Tiepolo, but it comes uh, with uh, some limitations. There's no food or drinks allowed. And since you're very welcome to touch all of the publications on the table, not to take them home, please. But don't touch the, anything that's on the walls. Uh, we need to be very careful about that. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Jan and Tobias. This is uh, one of a series, but it's also, uh, if you will look in the future into the program of Z33, um, this is part of an ongoing research, um, and that's what you will find on a, a website, on a research website of Z33, where all uh, these debates will be published, and the books and the references will be um, where you can find them back. Uh, we will start to share our uh, research and uh, instead of doing these talks in our house uh, in Z33, we started to do them uh, public uh, and use and abuse uh, somebody like Tobias, uh, Tobias Revel. Um, first of all, I would like to know why are you sitting here, you think? I'm here because I've spent the last uh, four or five years as a designer crossing over with uh, futurism. So I work at one end as, a, as, a, as an actual foresight analyst where I spend my time looking at the future and sort of trends and things. And the other side is a, as a uh, conceptual designer and kind of have a full uh, view of that whole field between design and futurism and also sort of teach it as well. So I teach uh, teach this stuff at the Royal College of Art and at the London College of Communication, which means I spend a lot of my time uh, reflecting and theorizing on ways in which um, uh, designers and artists as well can talk about and sort of talk with the future. So I've got a pretty s good spread, a good view of what's yeah. going on. Could you give uh, an example of a project uh, that uh, was kind of key project to, to understand what future was and uh, future uh, is for you? One of my projects. Yeah. yeah. 
So um, one of I have a very long ongoing project that I've been doing for about three years, which is called A Brief History of Power. And that's been looking at, um, from a design perspective, a very holistic analysis of how power um, in all forms, from religion to money to, to politics, has been structured historically and how it, and then sort of extrapolating into the future and doing it in a very visual way and, and building sort of visual things and designing things along this timeline uh, as they occur and kind of stretching into the future. And for me, that project, and I started that a long time ago, was kind of a revelation in how there's a continuum of, um, of specifically power in that case, but also how design is influenced by the sort of the state of the present and then the state of the future as it comes along or it might come along. So um, you use it as a tool. Um, yeah. Uh, and you relate it to everyday life. Uh, everyday life and how powers are playing a role in everyday life and um, is that something uh, new or I think it's something which is already done for ages. Uh, if you look back from uh, the arts and crafts movement to Bauhaus to radical design to what your mentors, teachers also did, uh, Anthony uh, Dunn and Fiona Raby. So where where is your um perspective of your um uh, insight um i think it comes from a very uh, academic and research based understanding of sort of the systems of and structures of power as they as they look in the present and then thinking about how they might come out in the future so as bef whereas before um, the focus has been on uh, creating, you know, to, to look at to look at um, Tony and Fiona. Historically, the, the 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 emphasis has always been on creating an object that might exist in a future home under a situation where, for instance, there's no more coal power and everyone has solar power. What does that object look like? Um, was an, an approach that I'm trying to I'm trying to use in my practice and also teach is actually sort of understanding the criteria that would lead to a sudden lack of coal. Like, why would that happen? What implications does that have for the, the geopolitical and financial landscape of that future world? And then tunneling down into the design from the bottom down, for, sorry, from the top down into, mm. that, into that object. Now, now it seems that you are only dealing with the future, but I think all designers are, in fact, probably are dealing with the future. Um, uh, it's yeah. intentional anyway, is, or don't you think so? I, I think all design is designed for the future. Um, Matt Ward, who uh, runs the design course at Goldsmith, has an excellent uh, quote, which is, all design is in the future. You know, even if you're designing a, a website or an app, you're designing it for a future. You're making certain assumptions about the state of the world in which that design is going to exist. But equally, a lot of design that is intentionally about the future, the kind of stuff that... Um, you know, design fiction is and, and critical designers and stuff do is really about the present. It's not really about the future. The future is used as a, uh, a sort of analogous prop that you can use then to reflect on the present and start to see things more clearly through, you know, an, an exaggeration of this future. So you're a knowist. You're not a futurist. <laughs> well, to the extent that all futurists think about, or futurists or foresight analysts or whoever think about the future in order to make decisions in the present. Uh, I think it's uh, so. It's not about the future. It's about now, and probably it's also about you, what you think and what you feel. Uh, so that's maybe also different than trend forecasters or uh, other people that are dealing with uh, uh, future thinking. Yeah, it's very hard. You uh, you have a very personal bias, as as you do in in any form of design. You would only you can only you can't really see that far beyond your own um, your own worldview and your own immediate environment. So there's a lot of criticism recently of sort of design futurism having a distinctly uh, white privileged Western um, uh, basis, which is entirely justified because it largely is at the moment and it's starting to spread. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen um, the growth of Afrofuturism and um, uh, Gulf Futurism coming out of the Arabian states. So there are sort of other schools of it popping up, but it's very hard 
to make a statement about a different worldview when you don't have that worldview. I did a project once um, based in the slums of Mumbai, and it was, you know, t to a Western audience, incredibly successful. A lot of people watched it. It's been on continuous exhibition for the last three years. But I constantly get criticism from people in that situation or people who know that situation saying, you know, how dare you? How can you possibly understand what life is like for these people? It's sort of a, mm. a dreamy-eyed view of this world that you have. The future is more and more about uh, a, a topic for designers and uh, an issue for designers. But um, are you also really taking a responsibility for that uh, creating that future society. I, that's what I hear in the last uh, situation or example. Um, if you, from the moment on, you formulate something, you intend something, you have a responsibility. Even if it is a chair or it is a story or a fiction that you want to share with us. Uh, it's interesting because I, I think there's a, there's a sliding scale Mm. you know, between the the amount of intentionality that you invest in it. So, you know, a lot of the projects, for instance, here at Milan Design Week will be thinking about sustainability, right? They'll be thinking about the origin of the materials used. Um, and that's important. That's a way of future thinking. That's thinking about the lifespan of a design. Equally, there will be projects, probably less, that start to think further on that and start to think about things like cradle-to-cradle -cradle production, which is also a form of futurism. Not just thinking about the lifespan of the product, but what happens when the lifespan is over, what happens to it. And there'll be even less projects probably actually saying, well, let's think about alternative context for this product. Let's take responsibility for, you know, I've designed this chair, but let's actually say it doesn't go into the type of place I want it to go into. What if it doesn't end up as some you know, bespoke designer chair in a gorgeous apartment and ends up being sold really cheaply as, you know, bar, f bar furniture or something. And then there'll be even further projects who, you know, the, the more really speculative cutting edge projects will actually say, well, I'm not going to design the chair, I'm going to design a future context and then design the chair that sits in that context. So I think there's a sliding scale in how you think about the future in relation to your design and then how you take responsibility for that future that you create, you know. But this was already done by movies uh, mm -hmm. years ago uh, yep. and, and stories and fiction. Uh, so why should design do it then? Uh, design, design fiction and, and fu design futurism owe a huge amount to film. Even mm. some of the terminology that's used is the same as used yeah. in film. Film's been doing it for a long time. Architecture's been doing it for a long time. Design should start to think this way because it's uh, just a, such a massive communication tool and such a massive method of consumption. Um, we consume and communicate much more with designed objects than we probably do with uh, film objects or uh, probably about as much as architecture objects. But it's, it's that, that level of uh, omnipotence, not om omnipresence that design has. It's important for it to start thinking the same way that film and architecture have historically about futures. Mm -hmm. The fictions that you create are never um, neutral. Hmm? Uh, I think anyway the design isn't neutral. Uh, any design is, uh, is taking a stance or a position. Uh, if it is a solution or not, uh, even the solution is taking a stance or uh, a position. Um, but the political aspects in your work are really crucial, I think. That is uh, something I see uh, in almost everything coming back. This is a, a personal interest. It has to do, of course, with these powers in society, but anyway, I see that as a, a kind of red l line throughout your... Yeah, um, I, I, I agree as well entirely with the idea that you, you take a position. And I think there's a problem that I have with some students where they have this perception of the designer as a neutral actor, so that the designer is just a person who stays in the background, creates a thing, goes out into the world, they have no responsibility for what happens to it, they, they don't imbibe it with any sort of inherent politics or inherent ideals, um, and that's, that's kind of wrong. You know, even if you, are just if, even if you are designing a chair, you still put a politics into it, you still put your own beliefs and systems into it. Um, and I, I, I kind of just recognize that and exaggerate it a bit and say, well, if I believe these things, you know, if I think, you know, I'm not trying to sell my my beliefs and my biases towards uh, certain powers or politics or, or beliefs, but certainly just making people aware that these things exist and they're inherent in everything that we design is really important. Mm -hmm. So I, I perhaps exaggerate them 
yeah. uh, more than you know a commercial designer might. Yeah, th that word beliefs. Maybe it's a uh, a side talk, but beliefs. Um, if I look to the title of your a lot of your works, they have a uh, a religious connotation. Uh, I think one it's of them coincidence. Does. I no, think one of them does. Several. Uh, Into Your Hands Are They Delivered yeah. is directly taken from Genesis. So okay. that was a project about a uh, synthetic biological future. It was a project about genetic engineering. Um, and I was interested in more, less, uh, I, I would never do a project that attacks religion because that's just kind of pointless and also it's it dangerous and you know I have no authority to do that. But it was more about grilling scientific method and drawing parallels between mm. scientific method as just uh, as, as a as a system of beliefs as much as religion could be interpreted to be, a, well, sorry, scientific method could be interpreted to be a system of beliefs in as much as religion could. Um, I like poetic titles for my work, certainly. So um, a lot of them have quite lengthy titles and I think that just comes from my admiration of literature and mm -hmm. like the works of um, science fiction authors who tend to use very long and poetic mm -hmm. titles for things. So it's probably owes more to that than biblical okay. references. Okay. <laughs> but language is anyway uh, important, I think, language and tools of design um, uh, give uh, people um, an, uh, a power uh, to create um, and shape a society. Um, I, I agree entirely. Language is, is super important. It's the most crucial, um, one of the most crucial tools we have as designers or as, or as people living in a society. Um, and it's it's one of, you know, one of the things that are, that is really important to do um, is to challenge the terms that it that exist. So, for instance, I'm doing a lot of work at the moment. I have been doing for the last two years around um, networks and things, and a lot of that involves demystifying terms like the cloud and the internet and what they actually mean as words, because those are designed words. Those are words designed to carry a certain meaning to people, which may not necessarily be inherently true. Um, so a word like the cloud, for instance, is designed to create this idea of some sort of mystical aura that's around us, whereas really the cloud is um, hardware and software that's owned by people in certain places. You're using these words. Uh, these words are shaping a society. Um, and that means that design is uh, uh, can shape a society. And that means that uh, future our future is makeable and that by your stories that you are creating your narratives that you are creating a society i don't say the society i don't say the future but a future and a society yeah uh, i mean design undoubtedly starts to make a future you know or, or at least presents a proposal for a future a single object can do that and um, yeah, but I don't know if the fictions that, that, that I and, and sort of the people working in this area create are necessarily proposals for a society. They're not saying this is our vision of how society should be. They are um, thought experiments to reflect on what is happening at the moment. So I don't know that necessarily that, we'd, it, that there's any attempt to make a society so much as... Well, perhaps there is, but only in, in the terms that it's a fictional society, only in the same way that you know J.R.R. Tolkien built a world. Right? It was to talk about the real world and to talk about the relationships in that world rather than a proposal for an actual world mm -hmm. that existed. Um, yeah, okay. If the design fictions are intended as thought exper uh, experiments, um, what would you find valuable criteria for evaluating the success of one of your projects or the projects in the realm of speculative design? That's a really good question, um, and one that's been discussed uh, within and around the field for the last sort of five years. Um, it's really difficult to answer because, uh, you know, if you are designing a chair, you measure your success on the amount of chairs you sell. If you're designing fictional worlds, you can't measure the success of them on how many people buy into it. So um, there's a couple of proposals for how that's measured. Press coverage is a good one, like <laughs> as a quantitative one. You know, a lot of these projects now get, I don't know about in, in Europe, but in the UK get mainstream press. They go into the major newspapers. You know, the exhibitions get covered in, in the major design um, publications. That's a kind of measure of success if people are paying attention. As far as, because that's not the intended effect, obviously the intended effect of these things isn't media attention. The intended effect is to sort of improve the way we think about the world, I guess. 
as far as measuring that, that's going to take a few more years to see if that happens. Um, there's kind of two different approaches here. So there's sort of the agonistic approach that's talked about here in adversarial design, where instead yeah. of you create designs that are intentionally made to force people into making a decision or to force people into taking a position they're not comfortable with, or there's the other method, uh, which is this idea of a trickle-down thing. So you train a load of design. I, a friend of mine has a great analogy of this, which is that speculative design is like the Velvet Underground, that no one really listens to it at the time, but years later you get loads of great bands. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this idea that you train a load of designers to think speculatively and think critically, and then 15 years later they're all heading up companies, uh, you know, mainstream design companies making normal stuff, but they sort of have that knowledge and that way of thinking in them which improves the wholesomeness of, of mainstream design. Um, but the, the stories that you're creating, the fictions that you're creating are not very bright. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> yeah, but no. I, sorry, but then there is also ethically the ontological, um, you know where you're heading to. You know that in this, this will in 10, 15 years will become a reality. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't expect no? any of the fictions that I've ever made to become a reality. Um, okay. I, I probably, but I think a lot of people in this field have a really anxious view of the future. Mm. And it's not necessarily an accurate view of the future, but they're certainly anxious about it. Mm -hmm. and uncertainty. Is uncertainty. Was only the, the playground you set uh, of um, managers, uh, lawyers, <laughs> and uh, other people. Exactly. So uncertainty is a really dangerous idea in post-2008 capitalism. It's really, it's, uh, there's a lot of great work being done around uncertainty at the LSE and places like that. Um, and design is often looked to, is looked to now in place of things like logistics managers and lawyers as a way of dealing with uncertainty. If you can make the perfect design, you might be able to, to stave off the uncertainty. Um, and I think a lot of what speculative design does is embrace uncertainty. Um, you know, if you, look, if you look at corporate design fictions, they, they say this is the future. This is our vision of the future. The future will look like this. Everyone will have, you know, mm -hmm. seamless glass. If you look at you know, futurists or speculative designers, they say, here are a range of futures that yeah. may happen. Now, that is uh, something we didn't point out, uh, out yet, because there are many futures, and there are possible futures, preferable uh, um, futures, uh, possible, uh, plausible, and, and, and so they, all, they also happen in, in different places yeah. all the time. So there's a, there's a great um, William Gibson quote. He was one of the first cyberpunk authors, and this quote is endlessly paraded out, which is that the future's already here, it's just not been distributed yet. So someone somewhere in the world, in probably in Silicon Valley, has the phone you'll have in two years. Mm -hmm. you know, and you probably have the technology that people in you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will have in 20 years. The future's already here, it just hasn't necessarily reached your point in space yet. Mm -hmm. with, with what kind of futures are you dealing? I was mentioning some. Uh, where, where is your scope? Uh, well, it, in terms of place, it's mostly here. Here, like I, I here find and now. Here, here and now, I find it hard to. There's, a, there's a diff You talked about this idea of improbable futures and probable futures. There's a, there's a kind of again, there's a sliding scale there. If you go too far one way and you create complete fantasy, it's very hard to. Um, communicate with people that because they see it as a fantasy, they see it as a fiction, they can easily dismiss it. Um, I'm into this idea of um, uh, what Nick Foster calls a future mundane, uh, other people call it an uncanny normal. It's a future that's very much like our present, just with slight tweaks. And that's the kind of that's a tool of literary fiction that's been going on for for decades, which is this idea that you you lull people into a sense of security and understanding and then you you throw in a twist, a tweak. And straight away that kicks the mind off down a look, uh, down a, a, the right kind of mm -hmm. avenue of questioning. Why is that different? Why you know why have people got six fingers on every hand? What has changed that that has happened? Rather than doing a whole kind of complete you know whitewash of the future. Yeah, yeah. But um, you said in uh, I researched you a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you said uh, that um, design is a trap. Oh right, yeah, that's yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, this is a really this is um so for years I I you know there's there's always the age I'm sure all of you are going through it. What is design? What is art? You know, da da da. There's a really um 
good idea that's been going around recently from um, a group of people called the Accelerationists, who are sort of a, a strange group of people, but they're kind of fun. Um, the idea that design is a trap, I don't think it's a new idea, but they're using it in specific reference to technology. And what they mean by that is that design doesn't, isn't necessarily the creation of anything new. It's the rearrangement of existing criteria in order to force a new behavior. Um, so in the terms that a rabbit trap is simply uh, the, the rabbit will want food, you put out food. The rabbit, you know, a twig, if you bend it, will maintain elasticity and then spring back. If you wrap it in a loop, the rabbit's head will go through it, it'll spring back, rabbit caught. You haven't actually created anything new. You've brought natural behaviors that exist in nature, rearranged them in your favor to get food, right? And that's the origin. And then they say that that is the origin of design, that, that idea of trapping things. And then they have a kind of uh, ont ontological thing here. So they talk about the idea of craft and craftiness. Um, the idea that these words kind of come from the same descent. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that design isn't necessarily, you're sort of just rearranging, and, and particularly this comes to play in speculative things and that idea that I just talked about of the uncanny normal, where things are normal. You know, the, the world hasn't fundamentally changed. Everyone behaves the same way. You've just rearranged things and pointed them in a different direction. And that's a, that's a design, that intentional kind of recalibration of reality to, to, to invent a new outcome. The needs stay the same, the behavior adapt a bit to the changing circumstances. Yeah, exactly. I don't think if you, if you created a, spe a speculative project where, you know, everyone in the world suddenly um, only ate toxic spill, mm. it would be really hard to believe that because why would people eat toxic spill? But if you had a future where you know, a speculative project where, for instance, fish stocks were running out, and so everyone ate tiny little fish in, in sort of extravagant packaging, as was done in a recent project. Um, that's a believable future, because the, the, the needs and wants of people are fundamentally the same. Um, I, did a, I did a talk in Manchester last week where I was sort of critiquing corporate design fiction and saying that, you know, a, a really good design fiction recognizes um, love, hate, fear, and and guilt as the major drivers of human behavior. It's not like wanting to fear. Fear definitely is, is anxiety is one of the major drivers of behavior. Scarcity, scarcity, yeah, born of fear and in response to. And these these things are natural behaviors, and you need to recognize their existence. And you can re-engineer people then into mm -hmm. those traps, into those designs. We're gonna bring it back a little bit to. Uh, design is a trap. Uh, what I see or what I w I'm afraid for is what we also now as an institute, what we are instigating is this uh, idea about uh, future thinking. Uh, I hate, in fact, uh, design thinking and even the word design thinking. Um, so for me, that is really problematic. Uh, I think it should be more about an attitude, how that we deal with uh, everyday life. And um, at the same time, um, that implicates, if I hear you well or in understand you, uh, that that is uh, directly related to, uh, instead of a, a future thinking, a future attitude or uh, a way how to deal with a future. By, by building traps. By building traps and by um, designing traps. Um, intentionally yeah um, but I, traps aren't necessarily are you saying that traps are a bad thing because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean okay so one of the the, the connotation is bad the, the, the word is bad and I think that's where the um, the interesting thing is is the assumption that a trap is bad but even a chair is a trap um, if it uses it uses uh, gravity and your desire your tired legs as criteria for a design um, that is a is in in a very uh, uh, raw definition a trap. Um, a trap doesn't actually have an inherent goodness or badness. I don't think it's just the re it's it's just a term used that's kind of catchy because it implies this re-engineering of behaviors and needs and desires for an outcome. Um, I don't think a trap has to be bad. It can be bad. Of course, it can be bad. It mm -hmm. can be very bad. But yeah. it can also be good. Uh, if um, if we see uh, another evolution uh, in design, and if we uh, go through the design and the, the language of uh, 
design and I will use it again, uh, maybe design thinking, uh, but I don't like to use that. Uh, I don't know what that is. No, <laughs> it's a kind of um, idea that, uh, um, uh, or that's the way I understand it, that by using uh, uh, design methodology, uh, you can answer um, or uh, relate to right. to everyday life and to uh, societal issues, yeah? even uh, wicked problems and so on. But uh, if this is going on, uh, we also see and uh, the tools that are uh, brought to the people that they more and more uh, democratized, uh, that they are uh, easily accessed and is that a good evolution or is that something you embrace as a, as a designer? Um, um, I think it's, it's uh, tricky, that one, because it's such a broad, uh, broad idea, the democratization of tools for design. I mean, because that could, I don't know, that could mean, so I think I said in, in my initial answer, it's going to be interesting to see um, in the UK, the government have just cut almost all funding to arts and design in, in informal education. So, so kids who are in compulsory education will have almost no training in art and design. And it's going to be interesting to see what effect that has. That's a complete de-democratization of design. That's literally removing it from democracy. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what effect that has on the thinking of those kids when they sort of leave university or when, even when they're going to university and what they expect. Um, and there's probably going to be a, a drop in basic stuff like lateral thinking and stuff. Design thinking, um, I don't. I most often come across it as mentioned by businesses. Businesses tend to use the word design thinking a lot um, to solving wicked problems as well. And I think in those terms, um, it's it's just it, like I said earlier. It's about combating uncertainty. It's just another tool they have that they can kind of get out and say, well, we think in a design way because design's incredibly good at. Um, solving problems like tired legs and gravity, um, and what was the our democratization? Yeah, well, is that uh, an interesting evolution, or um, because yeah, I think it's different. I, it's I was I was a bit curious about that question because I wasn't sure how to interpret it. Um, when you said democratization, I thought about things like Kickstarter straight away. So the idea that you can create a really specialist design where historically you may not have been able to find anyone to buy it or support it or put money into it now all of a sudden you know you can find the other thousand people in the world that want your weird internet connected flower pot um, and to me that's a kind of democratization of design in the sense that the the barriers to access like the levies put up by um by hierarchical systems are removed mm. you can you can now enter the design market as someone with no training so the powers are shifting yeah, the powers are shifting and the balance power, and it's kind of interesting because. Do you really believe that? No. Oh, okay, um, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you see what uh, what is happening with these crowdfunded and yeah. started companies after they're all being bought after out. two two years. So so Oculus Rift, um, which yeah. was the big Kickstarter success story, was bought by Facebook three weeks ago for a ridiculous amount of money. Great for Oculus Rift. The world, of course, has lost an amazing opportunity to actually have working virtual reality. Um, and I kind of actually sort of predicted that in a project last year that I put on here. Mm. So the project I did last year was about a world in which um, social engineering through social networks was augmented by completely sensory pervasive technology. And we're now actually starting to see that happen. So yeah, Kickstarter, but Kickstarter is only the first iteration. Um, Kickstarter is probably the first thing. I'm interested in the idea of localism as well. So um, the the oddly the the better connected network world instead of increasing is sort of facing a backlash now where people are going back to localism and you're seeing evolutions of highly localized systems things like free cycles and um, uh, you know like local grown produce and things like that. Um, and that, to me, is also a democratization of design. This idea that instead of having this huge global system that's controlled by a handful of businesses, you've now got you know, hundreds, thousands of different people who say, oh, I can grow my own apples in the garden. I can sell them to local people. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily a design thing. Um, but it, the same applies to a designed product. You know, if you're someone who spends their life you know, knitting socks and wants to sell them to, to mates or whatever, then you can do that now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Charlatan? You know that word? No? 
you're just uh, I'm trying to provoke you now a little oh, bit. Okay, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. <laughs> um, the the future is a, a moving target, Justin Pickard said. Uh, it's uh, it's How something. Did you respond? Yeah, it's uh, so. Uh, if we are sitting here next year, you will tell us another story. Yes. And uh, what I mean with that is that uh, it's what uh, Stuart Brandt was saying about in the end of the 60s and beginning of the, the 70s that every building is a prediction and every prediction is wrong. Yeah. So uh, everything what you do, in fact, is wrong. Uh, everything uh, what you say. Only if you read it as a prediction. Mm. Only if you read this method of design as predictions or proposals. Any futurist or speculative designer or, criti or critical designer, anyone working in that world will say that there's no way they can predict the future. There's no point in even trying and um, the future is a moving target. Um, uh, that's a completely correct thing. Stuart Candy talks about this idea of a futures cone. That as we're standing in one point in space and time, you can see sort of almost a 90 degree view of possible futures. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow you'll be looking in the same direction. Tomorrow, you know, you'll have something like another Crimea crisis and all of a sudden you're looking more to the right and that the future does move and new ones evolve and come out and, and change. Um, fundamentally, if anyone says they can predict the future, they're, they're lying. So <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, yeah. They're, they're but in, uh, in the design itself, uh, in also what we try to do as uh, designers, curators anyway, we try to pretend at least uh, uh, a possibility or um, an opportunity uh, or... So this uh, goes back to uncertainty. You know, if your design is a, is a short-term aim, if your design is um, a website or a chair or something for the immediate future, you know, for tomorrow or the week after, then you can be pretty comfortable that it will still function in that world because the world won't have shifted that fundamentally by that point. If you're aiming further afield, you know, into speculative territory, then uncertainty increases. And with that, um, the amount of investment you can put into your prediction decreases because you can never be correct. And so it becomes more, um, you know, more conceptual as a design exercise because it has to be highly mobile around that future space. I was in, in your answers that you pointed out uh, before, you were also uh, referring to um, uh, how the designers can influence creating our society and you were uh, referring to Chantal Mouffe. Um, and then you were also giving some examples like Meta Heaven and so on and how, what kind of role they play. Uh, can you explain that or? Uh um, uh, so so uh, Chantal Mouffe talks about the agonistic idea and that was the thing I mentioned earlier about this idea of an adversarial form of design. Mm. Um, again, there's a lot of debate going on in the field about what the difference between uh, making and facilitating futures are. Um, I think for most people it's more about the facilitation. Um, if you start to say, I'm going to design a future society, I'm going to perfect society as a designer, um, it becomes a kind of uh, fascist practice because it's just your point of view. And you can look back to like what Corbusier was proposing for Paris um, and sort of see the same thing where you're incredibly successful at doing things on a small scale, you try and scale that up, it becomes an architecture master plan. Um, and you upset everybody because you can't ever get everything right for everybody. Um, so I think design, speculative design and critical design and that those fields have more potential as facilitators for future. So rather than creating a wholesale future and sort of saying, here it is, we've made it for you because we're designers and we know what we're doing. It's more like, actually, we're not going to do that, but we're going to provide you um, a communication space or a thinking space where at least you can start to grasp your own future. At least you can start to think about it um, and this goes back again to this idea that we, we approached really early on about the difference between the future and futures. So the major sources of your information about the future are big tech companies and, and governments who say in the future there will be. Um, and this has led to what David Graeber calls um, the, 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 uh, a campaign on imagination. The idea that imagination has been under fire from business, from politics for the last, since the end of the Cold War, basically, mm. um, to try and stop the idea of imagining an alternative. And so this f area of design doesn't become about building a future and then delivering it to you. It becomes about saying, actually, we're going to give you a space where you can exercise imagination 
as a non-designer or even as a politician or a business person, we can say to you, you can come here, this is a playground where you can, you know, it's a serious playground, the dark playground, but it's a playground where you have some room to use your imagination again to imagine what the possible alternatives are or could be. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, I, if I see what is going on in the design world, uh, and I'm also at the same time also getting more and more critical about it, is that whole open movement and how that um, we, we had a short talk about it just before uh, the people entered uh, what is going on with the website of the UK government. Right. Um, there something else is happening. Uh, so that is maybe an alternative. Well, uh, the open source movement is kind of similar to what happened with Kickstarter projects. Mm. Um, as soon as there's blood in the water, the sharks will appear. You know, mm. if you put something out there on the, on the, uh, in, in the world and say it's open, anyone can use it, you know, it's totally, it's totally fine, it's up to you, anyone can have it, you know, you will find someone who says, oh, I can use that to make money. Um, and straight away that defeats the purpose of the thing. And there's also different definitions of what open source is. You know, free as in beer or free as in time is the, is the great phrase that keeps going around. And um, with something like government digital services, which is in the UK, um, uh, I, I'm going to explain UK context. But so in mm -hmm. the UK, um, the government decided to put all... All, and I think it was the last government, actually, not the current one, they decided to put all their internet presence completely free and open source. They said you can, you can freedom of information request anything. The, the, all the code, all the information, everything is open source. Anyone can use it. Anyone can copy it. And it's, amazing, it's an amazing thing. And it, it justifiably won design of the year last year in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, um, in the UK. Um, but the reason that functions and hasn't been ripped off is because it's backed by a global superpower. Right? Well, as Mozilla isn't. So it's, it's a bit of a different situation um, where an entire government is behind an open source project as opposed to a couple of guys in a garage in like Brixton, mm -hmm. which is like harder to, to kind of prop up and defend against people trying to take it. Um, I think this stuff, all this kind of thing, like just, you know, 3D printing, open source stuff, you know, crowdfunding, all that stuff will start to degrade the bottom of, of what's happening in, in hierarchy and structures simply because it moves so fast. It moves faster than, than large companies, large corporations, large tech firms can. Um, they're kind of monoliths with you know, the same tune that they just keep banging out every year. Um, but we're just in an interesting period where you know, it's a bit predatory at the moment, but it will probably pass. But the open source thing is problematic, and also the open source thing is, is deeply embedded with uh, gender issues and, and sexual issues. It's a deeply straight, white, Western male world. Um, largely devoid of, of, of women and anyone of color, which is problematic for itself. So if you go to the conferences they have, you know, if you, you kind of get a lot of sexism and stuff there, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't. Zoe Ryan um, is a curator of uh, the biannual in Istanbul. Um, and I'm gonna, can you tell a little bit about that and uh, how that you will deal with it? And the moment I'm, I'm then also as a curator, uh, of course, interested in how did you select a manifest? And uh, because then you take a position uh, from that moment on and what kind of position that will be. I'm curious uh, to hear that and yeah, and how that can become part of this discussion here. Um, in, yes, the title of our biannual is The Future is Not What It Used to Be. Um, and perhaps the first question that we should be asking is, so who, whose future are we talking about? Um, and that's what's kind of exciting about the project, because we did an open call for ideas, and we're actually in part two of a two-stage process, so we are certainly not predicting the future. Um, but we had about um, 800 submissions um, to our call. And fundamentally, the question that we asked people was um, to rethink um, or kind of redefine the manifesto for our time, to even ask the question, is the manifesto still relevant um, to our time? So, um, and we obviously have looked at what the manifesto uh, meant in the kind of mid part of the century, um, and then proposed what we are more looking for now as it relates to um, contemporary time of night. You should go on the website and read the entire text, because it's very long and obviously very, um, can get very academic about, um, about the manifesto and where it's sort of sat between um, for us, what was interesting is technically in the manifesto is a written document or something spoken. It sits between what has happened and what's going to come, but doesn't really propose any real 
um, possibility for how to get to that new point. Um, and they can be very loud and very arrogant. They're pretty male. They're pretty white. Um, and so we are interested in, obviously, this more international dialogue about the manifesto. We are less interested, potentially, in the future, as we are in maybe what um, Franco Berardi calls the continuous present. Um, and I think also one thing that um, I've been a bit shocked about that we haven't talked about here is the fact that we are also very conscious that we're not creatures of... Um, Progress is, is great, you know, that we should continually be looking at the future. Um, I think what I've been most interested in reading is that people are very sceptical, not only about the future, but how the future, and you, you've talked about it a lot, is so tied up with new technology and that we're absolutely obsessed with sort of the next gadget. I mean, you talked about it, that in Silicon, in Silicon Valley, I live in the States, in Silicon Valley, they, they'll be using a phone that potentially we're not using. Well, who gives a shit, you know, like, that's, that to us is not as interesting a conversation as um, proposing other types of possibilities that really are about everyday situations. Um, so the kinds of projects that we're looking at are very diverse, um, but as you can imagine, they're dealing with very real issues that are about the here and now um, in completely disparate parts of the world. I mean, we had 800 submissions from every corner of the world in about 42 countries, so it is quite, it is quite diverse. But that gives you a, a snippet of yeah. something. What is your first reaction? Because there I heard uh, an interesting remark about our obsession for technology. And we reduce maybe also the discussion on future and future thinking uh, to, towards technology. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you're right. It's a, it's a problem. And it's probably because uh, so much money is being invested by big tech companies in design. Um, and so designers, and particularly I don't, I, uh, in the places that I teach, technology is such an integral part of design education now, like understanding technologies even down to like manufacturing processes, and then design sort of playing catch up with the technology all the time. And one of the things I have a great interest in as a futurist is what's, you know, there's l f what are the alternatives are. So looking at things like um, Jugard culture in India, which is sort of making do with the things that already exist. Um, uh, things like how how technology isn't progressing, but is sort of being reconfigured in in places like sub-Saharan Africa, with um, uh, sort of uh, solar technology becoming really huge there, where it hasn't caught on in the Western world at all, and they're kind of reaching a a, a level playing field of of how much technology they want in their lives, and sort of rejecting any more progress than is absolutely necessary, which is kind of interesting, mm -hmm. um, and other forms of what people like to call innovation. So what, what it means to actually create new things that aren't technologically based, but are about designing and perhaps creating a new form of trap, you know, creating a, creating a rearrangement of things that already exist for a more favorable yeah. outcome. Innovation is the um, yeah. a, a, a definition of innovation is just connecting two different fields. Yeah, but innovation in 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 the developed world, in the Western world, has become tied up with technological solutionism. Mm. So where before innovation might have been like coming up with a new idea and figuring out how to do that or tying together two different tools, it's now become about creating a new technological product that will solve a problem yeah. that existed, um, which is one of the reasons that I think that we, we have so much focus on technology in our futures because it's all about what the next bit of technology will mean and what, that, what future it will bring. I think like... Uh, a lot of the future visions that we are confronted with are these uh, visions from corporate tech companies, which you mentioned, which in general are described as the thin visions. Uh, flat-packed visions. Yeah, yeah, the flat-packed visions, there we go. Um, but maybe also, I mean, we've, we've mentioned them before, Dun and Raby, um, they've been so instrumental in like, uh, kickstarting, maybe that's not a good word, but in kind of promoting this field of speculative design and in their practice, they say that they kind of go can go crazy on the social dimension, on the economic dimension, on the political dimension, but that they tie their practice to what is technological possible in the future. So even the complex visions that are kind of steering that area of fields, uh, or, or that field, um, have this what is technologically possible in the future background to them yeah. uh, and and maybe it's it's uh, a, a case in point for p 
people in the same speculative field with a practice that is related but not the same to kind of lose that technology vision as a start of their project. There are a couple of people who probably do reject technology a bit more, but I think in itself the fact that that practice exists is a critique of technological solutionism. Yeah. I, I think it is just the leading narrative in the developed world that technology will save us, right? Um, um, so as far as I understood, your work is, and the work that I've seen, um, is of course placed in the future, but mostly it is in the end about the critique of the current. So it really is about reflecting historically what has been happening, or if we refer to literature, the work of George Orwell is great because it learns us more about today or the society that we have at the moment. And um, considering the fact that commercial or corporations use, of course, future thinking as well, and what they do is simplify the future in the end. So I wonder, talking constantly about the future somehow fetishizes the future. And how, like, how do you... Um, make sure that your audience, which I wonder who it is actually, if it's your banking for designers or for you know, consumers. So how do you make sure that your audience understand that you're not fetishizing the future, but you're actually um, being driven by the critique of the current? That's my first question. And secondly, how do, what criteria do you have to reflect on today? Like, to decide what don't we want to innovate, actually? Because in the end, when we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about what don't we want to take with us? Right. Um, we don't want to take with us this climate uh, issue that we have, you know? So um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And how do you make sure that your audience understands that? The, l the last question, what are the criteria, that's, that is really complex and that goes right back to what we were saying at the beginning about it being very centered on you, right? So my, few, I don't want to call them my future visions because that sounds so ridiculous. My, 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 uh, my projects tackle things that I find personally concerning. Uh, in, light, in reference to, to climate change, I, I see that as the single greatest threat to civilization that we've ever faced. Um, it's insurmountably infuriating how little is being done about it. And I, I, I actually, um, I do this talk every now and again, which Karen has helpfully printed out, and I've yet to find a, a project that deals with climate change to the level that it should be dealt with, not just sort of a sustainable product or something, but actually like saying, here is humanity's extinction coming up. So the criteria for what goes through are very personally driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder, how do, you, how do you make sure that people read the, the, the critique or the proposal or the alternative that you have in the project? Because it's it's speculative, right. so it's somehow subjective. Plus, it is aesthetics. It is in the yeah. it's set in the future. So, how do I read as your audience that it's about climate? That you don't <laughs> want to continue the climate? I mean, it's a bit no, no, of it's course, not an attack, and it's it's no, 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 and it's a really it's a really important yeah. thing, um, and it's kind of interesting because there are a lot of different ways of doing it. And I think it's a mix of aesthetics and humor to an extent. Um, humor is a great tool in this because it is kind of dark and it helps. And if and it's I don't particularly. Um, ironically, I haven't exhibited as much in the UK as I have elsewhere. For someone with a really dark British sense of humour, people seem to understand it. But uh, so, for instance, looking at the work of Dunn and Raby, there's a, there's a de there's a decision to do a non-realistic aesthetic, right? To actually say, let's not produce photo real objects of a future, but let's actually make something that's kind of cartoonish or lower resolution. Cartoonish isn't the right word, but like lower resolution, and that's to give a distinct message that this is just a. Um, a model, it's a sketch, it's not a reality. Um, the other question, the other problem that you've raised, I, I think in a roundabout way, is this idea of the hoax, which is really, really problematic. And you'll probably find among speculative designers two major thoughts on this. Some people think the yes men are the greatest speculative designers that ever existed. And, oh right, so the idea of the hoax is the idea that you, you, you create a future vision but you don't tell people it's a fiction. You tell people that it's real. Um, or you, maybe you don't tell people it's real, but you don't you don't you don't present it as a fiction. Exactly, exactly. So, I've I've done that before, and I won't wouldn't do it again because it leads to confusion. Because people approach it as real, and then when you tell them it's not real, they immediately dismiss it because they think, well, they feel they feel bad for being tricked, essentially. 
yeah, they've been trapped, but not in a good way. Not in like a, I agree to go with this trap to see what happens, more in a like you force them into that position and now you've really annoyed them. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is to do more like the Dun & Rabia approach, which is from the beginning to say very openly, this is not really possible. This is not really even probable. It's highly improbable. It's, you know, extreme. It's low resolution. It's kind of like, it's total speculation. So in the end, it's more, I, I wonder who is then your audience? Because if I think about speculative design and most of the designers or architects thinking about the 60s and the 70s. I mean, we do love Super Studio, but it's in the end, as you say, very underground and it remained in our own circle. But the critique that you have that, like for instance, climate change, it goes beyond designers. So in the end, ultimately, you would like to reach people that do not design, okay. but, do, but do actually make, um, you know, political decisions or economical decisions. So mm. that's why for me, I wonder, it's an interesting idea for me to think about is who is your audience in the end and how do you make sure that you do reach the politician or the... I yeah. think there are different audiences. So so the, the sort of the velvet underground method I mentioned earlier, like designers do look at this work. Like it is, ex you know, last year it was exhibited in Milan. People who are designers come through and you have a conversation with it about them. Uh, sorry, uh, with them about it. And they, they maybe take that back to their practice, they do some more research, they start to think about it. Um, so that's one of the audiences. Um, another audience is, is sort of almost a curious public who go along to these things. That's growing a lot more, I think. There's more and more people who are willing to engage with it. And that is, again, part of the greater press coverage of this kind of work, which is also problematic because, going back to the idea of the hoax, there's a lot of times when these projects are approached by the tabloids as, oh my god, how could they do this? How could they genetically re-engineer a mouse to have wings when it's just a speculative project? Um, and then finally, the, the idea of how you get to people who can make the decisions, how you get to like policymakers is really important. And that goes back again to this idea of an agonistic approach. Um, and if we're going to do a parallel with climate change here, you've got this recent turn amongst climate scientists away from a position of neutrality to actually becoming activists in this field and saying, um, you know, just providing statistics isn't good enough. We're actually going to go out and become activists. We're actually going to lobby people. And I think that's going to start to happen potentially more and more with design, um, with this kind of field of design where it does become more direct, you know. And major design companies are employing speculative practitioners more and more to kind of critique their work and critique their, their, their way of working. So I think that's the other way that it, it might happen. More Questions? Yeah, um, I think next year, if I hear you, we will be all design activists. Yes. Yes. Just activists. Just activists. Just general activists. Not activists. You don't have to be yeah. a designer. Okay. So we go from uh, facilitating, uh, maybe we should call it better next time, future facilitating attitudes or attitudes facilitating futures or something like yeah. that yeah yeah perhaps perhaps it, yeah i think an attitude change may be necessary yeah mm -hmm. future facilitating not future making yeah necessarily. okay thank you i want to close i would like to thank you all for being here and taking part in our discussion thank you and maybe see you tomorrow thank you tobias <laughs> <laughs>